Sakura Quest's instrumental soundtrack doesn't stand out. In fact, it seems as if it's trying its hardest to stay in the background. And that is precisely why in this video I'm going to be analyzing it, trying to find out what works and what doesn't, and see how even little things might add to or subtract from a scene. This is a bit of a challenge for myself as well, to see if I can find something interesting to say even about a seemingly average soundtrack. Initially I was planning to cover at least the first three to five episodes, but as I wrote for the first one and the script grew longer and longer, I realized it would be best to limit it to just one so that it's more manageable. One interesting and somewhat unusual thing is that the music group No Name, who are composing the music for the series, did both the opening theme as well as the rest of the music for the show, with their only previous work in anime being the OP, ED, and insert songs for Hai to Genso no Grimgar. The group seems to be relatively new from what I can find, as their Twitter was created in late 2015 and they have a pretty sparse discography. I will be focusing on the instrumental music here, but I do have to say that the opening theme is fantastic. It really draws you in right off the bat. There's a great sense of flow, but it also never gets samey. The main piano riff is really catchy, and it even utilizes the banjo for that countryside feel. It does well to get you ready for the episode to come. We are at first presented with a flashback sequence to a regal looking occasion, and the music does its best to cue us into that. We have the standard strings accompanied by the harpsichord, an instrument that was invented sometime around the late middle ages, but fell out of favor by the late 18th century, with the piano taking its place at the stage due to the ability to control note length and the vast dynamic range of the instrument. It is almost always used to musically depict that general period of time in European culture, due to it being incredibly popular then, but now being fairly obscure excluding performances of those works composed when it was still in regular use. The piece in this scene is rather brief, but one interesting aspect during the transition of fantastical memory to real life is that the string section seems to break away from the more baroque stylings a bit as wind chimes begin playing, letting us know the dream sequence is at its end. When I heard these chimes at the end, it made me realize that with the twinkling of the lights at the beginning, we also hear wind chimes, giving us an immediate auditory cue that this is a memory or dream sequence of sorts. The next piece jumps in shortly after with a sharp brass intro letting us know this is the real deal. It's much tenser than the lyrical fantasy prior, and there's an ever-present tempo marker underneath the whole time, starting off in the triangle and symbol. To me, it gives a sense of time passing, tick by tick, even with every failure, and the lack of room to ebb and flow adds to the tension. Interestingly, the piece transitions into a much jazzier style halfway through, with the addition of double bass, conga drums, and maracas. Then there is a reprise where the initial trumpet theme returns, but this time accompanied by all the instruments, before ending just as it began with the solitary ticking of the triangle and symbol. I do like the use of the constant beat, but I think the introduction may have been perhaps a bit bombastic, even if it was trying to accentuate Koharu's feelings. A subtler vibe throughout, such as what comes in later on with the double bass, could have added to the tension in a less exaggerated but overall more effective manner, and ultimately it does feel as if the piece was trying to mesh two fairly separate ideas. The next piece is one that might be pretty easy to miss. When it first enters, it is almost completely covered by the characters talking, and the various environmental sounds, and its presence doesn't become apparent until it is nearly over.
This piece is a pretty fascinating one. While Koharu is at what may be her lowest point, frustrated, depressed, and arguing with her mother, underneath we hear this wistful, very gentle, and emotional piano piece, one you would expect to be paired with the scene of romance, nostalgia, close friendship, or perhaps a bittersweet parting. Not this fairly unromantic point, which the show presents more as being frustrating than sad, especially considering that Koharu does have something to fall back on, even if it is not her desire to do so. There's a couple ways to approach the usage of this piece. The easiest conclusion to reach is that they just needed to have a piece in the background, and pick this one out from the many available pieces because they felt it fit just fine. But I'm curious if there was a bit more intention to the usage of it. For instance, its usage could be to imply the mother's presence from the point of inner emotions. Though her tone is strict, it is still clear that she misses her daughter and cares deeply for her, otherwise why would she even call? Maybe the piece is indicative of developments to come in the future with Koharu's personality and surroundings, a sort of emotional spoiler. Or it could be trying to show the dichotomy between Koharu's inner feelings and her outside expressions, the self-reflection she is undergoing inside versus the harsher display she puts on to her mother, refusing to accept or at least admit to certain aspects about herself, her situation, and the world. Of course, there is no right answer. It could be none of them, it could be all of them, but that's part of the beauty to music and how it can very subtly affect how we internalize a show or even a particular scene. This time, there's a decently long gap before the next piece. Once Koharu arrives at Manoyama, a piece jumps in at the realization that there has been a mix-up. It's got a traditional blue style to it that really adds to the comedy of a scene that could have very easily ended up being just plain uncomfortable. Overall, though, I haven't got much to say about this one. The next piece is a comforting duet between piano and guitar as we're introduced to Shiori and the other members of the tourism board, as well as to the town itself. The piano takes the backseat to the guitar here, playing exclusively right hand and overall being much less than the guitar both in volume and in frequency. The guitar takes over the role that the piano would usually have, that of providing the tonal backing through chords. Here they are strummed in the guitar while it also has a melodic back and forth with the piano. The melody tentatively steps in and out as it explores the possibilities. There's an improvisational feeling to it as a result of the heavy use of chords and the sparse, spacey melody, as well as the more intimate instrumentation. You could easily picture two friends at ease, playing together and making stuff up as they go. That paired with the relaxed tempo gives it a warm, homey type of vibe, one very fitting with the comfortable little town of Manoyama. After that, we have a bit of what may be diegetic music. Diegetic music is that which is coming from a clear source within the scene itself. The first piece also had hints of this, with us seeing a man playing on screen. This piece sounds a bit distorted, as if coming from a radio within the scene, and seems exactly the type of music Kadata would pick to accompany his long explanation behind the Chupacabra's origins. It's cheesy, overdramatic, and brings some comedy to the scene as he tries to use the excessively grand music for such a ridiculous tale, one that is ultimately rather boring, helped in no part by the dull, slow pace of the music. But really, that all helps the moment. <laughs> This piece isn't really meant to be a fantastic piece as a work of music, because it's serving a purpose more along the lines of sound effects. It needs to be believable and fitting with what the character would choose. The town's project to revitalize is only now being revised, so it's rather fitting the piece for their coronation ceremony is far out of date. After the mid-episode title card, hey, we're halfway through. We jump right in with a groovy trumpet section in a piece that at first sounds bizarrely similar to another piece from the Incredibles OST. (laughs) 
The similarity doesn't last very long though, as it explores elsewhere, dabbling in a fun conversation with the sacks. <laughs> There's a nice sense of dynamic variation, as it crescendos, drops to a quieter volume, then builds again, closing out on a long note as they raise their glasses together in toast. It definitely sets an at ease but still lively and fun atmosphere as they drink and chat together. The piece and the show work together to make these characters appealing and enjoyable to be around despite the short time we spent with them thus far. Though I am curious of the difference in emotional effect that a less brassy and in-your-face type of piece, or even no piece whatsoever, would have had. The next piece, which enters as Koharu realizes she signed up for a year-long job, not a couple-day gig, is a pretty fun one. At first we hear snare drums and cymbals in the style of a military march as she begins to read the page regarding her coronation, a clear direct musical representation of the governmental idea behind a coronation. However, as she continues reading, the brass and woodwinds enter one after the other, so that it builds into the big reveal, that being she did indeed sign up for a year. After the reveal, and now turning to her attempts to fix it, the music cuts out briefly and then jumps back in, this time with a spastic piano playing on top of the snare drums, cymbals, and tuba beneath. The piano traverses all across the keyboard, as if following her rapidly racing train of thought at this realization. However, when her manager hangs up on her, wishing her luck, the piano cuts out and we're left with just the percussion. After this, a short two-note motif is established. Initially just in percussion and piano, it's then built upon, with later the piano having a downwards glissando into it, and what happens between each time the motif is repeated varying, as well as the distance between each time the motif is repeated getting shorter. It then repeats the crescendoing staggered entrances from the initial reveal before closing it out with the final restatement of the two note motif. <laughs> this piece may be my favorite thus far. There's so much character and variation to it, and without it, the scene would not work near as well. The ebb and flow of the music matches up perfectly with the beats of the scene, and it just sells the moment. The instrumentation is great, and the way it establishes an idea and then develops upon it in the short period of time works really well. It's difficult to create a piece with much direction when you have to compose something so short, as is often the case with background music, but here the composer succeeded brilliantly. After Koharu has a brief conversation with the bus driver, the bombastic tone returns when she exits, almost picking up where the previous piece left off, even though this time the instruments used are very different. <laughs> Later, when Karuta, dressed in the Jubakabra costume, jumps out to scare Koharu and try to get her to experience being a hero, yeah, his logic is questionable even with context. We hear a blues rock style piece with a drum set, electric guitar, keyboard, and harmonica. Rather than variating, it keeps its intensity throughout the scene, but then drops down suddenly when Koharu whacks Kadita with her bag, giving a comedic beat to the scene and letting us know the threat is gone. It then closes out with a short little guitar riff, the final note matching the ambulance's exit. A short but fitting piece. The next and final piece is a bit more dramatic in tone. As Shiori apologizes for their stunt, but thanks her for coming, even if she is to leave, a gentle solo piano brings a beautiful and wistful tone to the scene. Again, it feels tentative, as if at moments the pianist is waiting till the last moment to play the next note. 
As Koharu thanks Shiori for her kind words, it seems as if the accompanying music subtly develops to a more positive and hopeful tone, though unfortunately the piece is too short to take much form. After this, the ending theme enters, signaling the end of the episode and time for some concluding thoughts. So yeah, this was fun and to be honest, pretty hard. Trying to break down every little piece, no matter how short or inconsequential, can be pretty tiring, especially when there's not much to say. But it was a good experience and quite educational for myself and I hope for you too. For some of these pieces, I wouldn't have listened half as close if I had not been trying to make this video. Yet as a result of doing so, I feel like I found some really interesting things. Perhaps in future videos I won't cover every piece, but I definitely will be listening a little bit closer. So thanks for watching! Be sure to let me know what you thought of the video. This is one of my longest scripted videos in a while, so definitely a bit of a challenge for me, but I hope it turned out well. If you're looking for other videos of mine to check out, I recommend my analysis of some of the music in Sangatsu no Lion, or my video on why Dango Daikazuku is so effective at inciting emotion. Of course, subscribe if you haven't already, and follow me on Twitter at Core Reviews for frequent updates and random thoughts. You can also check out my second channel for less structured and more varied content. I do have to apologize if you start to see less of me in the future. I'll be starting college for a BM in viola performance in just a few weeks, so I will be much busier than before. I will do my best to keep putting videos out though, and I hope to see you all in the next one.